Hi, my name is Meredith and I am the Environmental Center Director for the Havre de Grace Maritime Museum. Today I'm going to be giving a lecture about monarch butterflies. So in this lecture we're going to be discussing three main points, metamorphosis, migration, and milkweed. So firstly we're going to touch on how do monarchs metamorphose from caterpillars and what happens in each phase of their life. Then we're going to dive into how do monarchs travel such far distances to reproduce and survive the journey. Their migrations are amazing, which is something that a lot of us know already, but how are they able to make it from point A to point B and survive? Lastly, we're going to touch on why milkweed is so important to butterflies and how we can protect milkweed. Okay, so this is the lifespan of a monarch butterfly. They start their lives as an egg and they're in their egg stage for about three to four days. They then hatch from their eggs and come out as larvae or caterpillars in this case. And they're in their larval stage for about 10 to 14 days, which is about two weeks on average. They're caterpillars for, as I mentioned, about two weeks. And then they go into something called a J stage, which only lasts for 24 hours. Now I'm gonna discuss what I mean by J stage a little bit later, but just know that this is the period of time when they're preparing to go into their pupil stage or when they're preparing to go into their chrysalis. So once they're in their chrysalis and they're a pupa, they are in their chrysalis for about 10 to 14 days. Again, on average, about two weeks. Once they emerge from their chrysalis, they are an adult and their lifespan as an adult is very variable depending on um, whether or not they're going to be migrating. So adults that are not migrating only live two to five weeks and adults that are migrating live about eight to nine months. So the egg stage. This is, you can see a picture on the right, a zoomed in photo of what the egg casing looks like. And then the photo on the left shows you just how small the eggs really are. So females lay one egg on the underside of a milkweed leaf near the top of a plant. And she'll try to only lay one egg per milkweed plant because as a caterpillar, they'll eat basically the entire plant's worth of leaves. So if they lay two eggs per plant, then there isn't going to be enough food for both. So she'll lay one egg on the underside of a leaf on the top of a milkweed plant, and she'll lay about 300 to 500 eggs in her lifetime. The eggs, as you can see, are a sort of milky off-white or yellow color when they're laid, and they're only as large as the tip of a pencil. So they're tiny, tiny, tiny eggs. They turn translucent with a black tip when the larva is about to emerge, and that black tip is actually the head of the larva that's getting ready to chew its way out. To secure the egg to the plant, the female mother will um, secrete a sort of glue to keep the egg attached to the leaf, so that way it doesn't fall off with the wind. The eggs have a waxy outer layer to keep them from drying out, and have a hard shell called a corian is my best guess at um, saying that word properly. <laughs> so when the larva emerges, they then eat that shell casing, that corian, for extra nutrients, which isn't uncommon for a lot of animals. So this is the larval stage or the caterpillar stage. Um, these are actually photos from my caterpillars that I raised myself last summer. Um, you can see the picture on the left is the caterpillar the day that it came out of its egg casing. Um, that photo was actually taken within a few hours of it chewing its way out of its egg casing and then eating that egg casing. Um, and then in a matter of 12 days, the caterpillars that I have are massive. Um, so all insects undergo metamorphosis and have a larval stage. Um, just to clarify, the larval stage in a monarch's life is a caterpillar. So that's what I'll be referring to it as. 
So once they emerge from their egg casing, they're a white translucent kind of color with a black head. They don't gain their characteristic yellow and white and black striping until they start consuming milkweed. This is because the bright yellow and black coloration is used as a warning sign to predators saying, hey, I'm toxic, you don't want to eat me. Now, monarch caterpillars are able to eat milkweed, which in and of itself is toxic and is toxic to most living things. That's one of their main ways of protecting themselves against predation. So monarch caterpillars eat milkweed and once they start to actually munch, then they get that really bright coloration. So monarch caterpillars will eat on a standard milkweed plant in size, about 20 to 30 leaves when they're in their larval stage. So this is, as I mentioned before, usually the entire plant from the top to the roots. So they'll wipe out an entire milkweed plant in their larval stage. And in order to actually consume all of these 20 to 30 leaves, they don't sleep or rest at all when they're caterpillars. All they do for their 10 to 14 days in which they're in this stage is eat as much milkweed as they can. Because of this, they grow 2,000 to 3,000 times their size in just 10 to 14 days. That's unheard of kinds of growth. I mean, you can see in the picture here, the picture on August 2nd, they're, it's such a tiny caterpillar. And then within 10 days, it's so much larger. So to put this in perspective, if a human baby grew at the rate that caterpillars do, then they would be the size of the Statue of Liberty in two weeks. So this is no easy feat. During this stage, they molt their skin five times to account for the growth. And by molting their skin, I mean they shed their skin and then they have new skin grown underneath. And after their fifth molt, they're ready to pupate. This is just another example of how astonishing that growth rate is. You can see these were my caterpillars on the far left picture on August 10th. Overnight, they were significantly larger and then overnight again, significantly larger. So this growth is, if you keep your own caterpillars, it's like you can watch them growing. So to get a little bit more into the nitty gritty of the larval stage, I'm going to talk about the way that caterpillars are built, essentially. So caterpillars have three main body parts, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. They also have antenna on the top of their heads. Now, they do have 12 eyes, sort of pseudo eyes, that aren't really capable of much other than noticing changes in daylight. Um, but still, they do have 12 visual receptors. They also have three pairs of legs attached under their thorax and five pairs of false legs. So all insects are characterized by having six legs. These guys have about 10 extra false legs under their abdomen, which are used mostly like little suction cups to keep them from falling off milkweed plants. So this is the J stage of a caterpillar's life. It's called the J stage because the caterpillar actually forms the shape of a J. And this is when they're going from their larval stage to going into their chrysalis. Now, I do have a video that I'm going to show in a moment. Um, but for now, I'm just going to talk about what the J stage actually means and what's happening during this stage. So... The first thing that caterpillars do when they're ready to go into their chrysalis is wander to a safe and sturdy place to pupate. So they don't actually go into their chrysalis on a milkweed plant because milkweed plants don't have a very long lifespan. They can die, they can fall over. They're not a safe place to stay during this period of time when they can't actually defend themselves. So they usually stick to sticks, logs, trees, I've seen them stuck to the side of a building before, which is pretty interesting. Um, but long story short, they usually find a protected area with hard materials to attach themselves to. 
Once they find a suitable spot, they spin a silk mat from the bottom of their head using something called a spinneret. Then they use a hook-like appendage called a cremaster that's located near the rear end of the caterpillar. So they spin a mat, they take a little hook and hook themselves into that silk mat that they just spun, and then hang upside down and shed their skin one last time. Now this is the, the sixth molt, if you will. When they shed their skin this final time, the chrysalis is actually fully formed underneath the skin of the caterpillar, and it's revealed when there is that sixth molt. So. Once the monarch has gone through its J stage and it is now in its chrysalis, as we just watched in the video, which is so cool, um, this is where the magic really happens. So no one really knows what happens when a caterpillar transforms into a butterfly. What we do know is that up to 80% of the caterpillar dissolves. And when I say dissolve, I mean dissolve like it 
basically turns into a butterfly goo. 80% of its body is liquefied when it goes from its pupil stage to becoming an adult. And somehow, two weeks later or even 10 days later, a butterfly emerges from that butterfly goo, if you want to call it that. Now, this is unbelievable to think about. How does an animal basically liquefy and then reform into what it's supposed to. But not only that, butterflies are actually able to remember lessons that they learned as caterpillars. So there was a study conducted by Professor Martha Weiss of Georgetown University who looked into just this. So in order to determine memory from the larval stage, Weiss subjected a group of tobacco hornworm moths to a gas called ethyl acetate. Now, this gas is very pungent um, and is very evidently different to regular air. And when she subjected these tobacco hornworm moths to ethyl acetate, she also gave the caterpillars a little bit of a shock. So very quickly, they associated this smell with a shock, which is not a very comfortable thing. So after the caterpillars pupated into adults, and once they emerged from their chrysalis, they were given the opportunity to go through two chambers. One had fresh air and one had the ethyl acetate being pumped through it. So one had that smell associated with it that they associated as caterpillars with a shock. So when the grown-up butterflies emerged, they overwhelmingly chose the fresh air, which we can construe as caterpillars learn lessons and these lessons will allow them to survive. And they're able to actually take those as not necessarily memories, but lessons learned, I'll say, and bring that into adulthood with them, despite dissolving. So this is the photo of the pupil stage from the first day that caterpillars spin their chrysalis all the way into the day that they're about to emerge. So you can see that they start as this beautiful green color with gold spots um, and then go all the way to black and orange, which is when the adult is ready to emerge. So those gold spots or gold dots that you see, um, scientists believe are a part of the chrysalis in order for them to reflect light. So that helps them camouflage themselves. That's what scientists believe anyways. Um, and the sort of like green coloration that they start out as is again, a way to camouflage themselves. Um, but by the end of their pupil stage, the chrysalis is translucent and the butterfly can be seen right through it. So Inside the body of a caterpillar, some of the aspects of the adult butterfly have already begun to form. So we talk about how they liquefy and then emerge as an adult. Some of this is magic. Some of this, the caterpillar already had formed inside of its body. So some aspects of the adult that have already been formed inside the body of a caterpillar are the legs, the wings, and some of the vital organs. And again, the rest just magically assembles out of this, <clears throat> excuse me, out of this butterfly type goo. So when an adult emerges from its chrysalis, it's not immediately able to fly. It takes about six hours after emerging to be able to fly because it takes about six hours for them to be able to pump the blood from their abdomen all the way out to the tips of their wings. So when they emerge, they're, they're really soft and they're really vulnerable. And it takes a long time to pump that blood all the way where it needs to go. So that way the wings can stiffen up properly. After six hours, then they're able to fly away. Um, this little six hour time period is actually how I was able to get the photo that's in the first slide of me with a butterfly on my nose because it was still in that six hour time frame. So it couldn't fly away from me, which made, made for a good photo shoot. Um, 
So during the pupal stage, a caterpillar's mouth morphs into a proboscis. So caterpillars eat and chew solid food. Monarch butterflies as an adult sip nectar and don't actually chew anything. So the chewing mouth parts are transformed into something called a proboscis, which is like, sort of like a straw. So as soon as the adult is, it's been six hours, its wings are stiff, it's able to go, that's when it immediately goes on a hunt for nectar to restore its energy. Now I mentioned at the beginning that adulthood either lasts for a matter of weeks or a matter of months. And when I say that adulthood lasts for a matter of weeks or a matter of months, I mean anatomically the identical butterfly either lives for a very short period of time or a very long period of time. So if they're not biologically different at all, what determines their lifespan? Well, some butterflies that live for a very short period of time are only going to reproduce and then die. Butterflies that live for a very long time are going to migrate. And the indicators in their environment that determine their lifespan and determine whether or not they migrate or just reproduce is a combination of temperature, daylight, and milkweed accessibility. So scientists believe that temperature in part determines the lifespan of monarch butterflies. So most butterflies are born in the summer and live only a matter of weeks with the sole mission of reproduction. Once temperatures begin to drop and daylight decreases and milkweed begins to die off, that's when butterflies know, as well as we know, that fall is coming. So from there, a butterfly's sole mission is to migrate south for the winter. And as we already know, they live for about eight to nine months to achieve this migration. What's truly amazing, and I mentioned this before, but I just want to stress this, that there is absolutely nothing different anatomically about the butterflies that live for a few weeks or several months. Some just reproduce and that's the end of their life. Some are able to travel thousands and thousands of miles over several months. The only difference is the time of year in which they're born. So, reproduction. Monarch butterflies begin reproducing when they're about three to eight days old. They will mate with several different partners over their lifetime, and they are not the generation of monarchs to migrate. So these are the first, let's say one to three or four generations in the summer um, are the ones that just reproduce and that's the end of their life. The eggs are fully formed inside of the female before fertilization, but have tiny holes in the outer shell that allow for sperm to enter. Then females lay, as we already know, hundreds of eggs on monarch plants, on milkweed plants, excuse me, um, and they're really trying to create a strong generation that will be able to last the long journey south. So, migration. Monarch migration, as we all know, is a really special and mystifying thing. How do these tiny creatures travel thousands of miles twice a year? Well, monarchs are actually the only known butterfly to make a two-way migration like birds do. That's pretty interesting. Um, and instead of overwintering like most butterflies, monarchs travel to avoid freezing temperatures. They're known to travel as far as 3,000 miles. So how do they do this? Several different things. Firstly, they use something called a thermal. A thermal is a column of rising air. Um, it's a hot patch of air that's caused by uneven heating of the earth. So thermals form air whenever it is at least a few degrees warmer than the air next to it. And basically, when warmer air meets cooler air, the less dense 
warm air floats above the more dense cold air. So thermals are high above um, colder air. And warmer air has faster moving particles in it. So once a monarch is able to catch a thermal with warm, faster moving particles, it's actually able to soar. So the energy of the thermal itself takes the monarch up to a mile without them having to use any energy flapping their wings. Without thermals, monarchs would not be able to make their migration journey. Next, they use directional aids. So no one really knows how monarchs are able to travel such long distances without getting off track, but scientists have a few theories. So once monarchs get a sense of the fact that seasons are changing, they utilize the sun and the sun's position as it changes daily um, to figure out where to go. So while the sun's position changes over the course of the day, um, their use of the sun is able to accommodate that. So they rely on a biological clock located in their antennas and that tells them the time of day. So they're able to adjust to where the sun is in the sky over the course of the day. So when flying south, they'll keep the sun on their left in the morning and the sun on their right in the afternoon. So they're able to accommodate the fact that the sun rises, <clears throat> excuse me, on one side and sets on the other. So we know that butterflies are able to use the sun and the sun's placement in the sky as a way of determining where south is, but the sun isn't always out. So how do monarchs know where south is if it's cloudy outside? Monarch's antenna not only contain the ability to, or the biological clock, as we'll call it, um, to determine where the sun is and how much time has passed in order to figure out where south is. They also have a sort of magnetic compass, which tells them how close they are to the equator. So when flying south, they fly towards the equator using the lines of the Earth's magnetic field. And when traveling back north, which a few generations later of monarchs will do to get back north, um, that internal compass recalibrates in a sense. So scientists believe that they're able to know to fly towards the equator during a certain time of year and then away from the equator during a different time of year in the same way that there's environmental triggers that make them feel the need to migrate in the first place. So this is the general migration path of monarch butterflies. Um, where a monarch migrates to depends on where it's born in the world. So monarchs born on the eastern side of the Rocky Mountains migrate to and from central Mexico. And monarchs born on the western side of the Ro Rocky Mountains don't have to travel nearly as far. So their de destination is the California coast, and they go to pretty much the southern tip of the California coast. Monarchs begin their journey south, usually mid-August. So another way that they're able to survive this journey is the fact that they actually cluster together for protection. If you see this photo, pretty much everything that you see that is in green is a monarch butterfly. So they'll cluster in the thousands together um, in order to protect themselves from predation, cold temperatures, and the elements. Monarchs tend to roost in particular environments. So Western monarchs that are born on the Western side of the Rocky Mountains like to roost in eucalyptus, Monterey cypress, Monterey pine, and other trees and groves. Whereas monarchs born on the eastern side of the Rocky Mountains like to roost in conifers, maple trees, pecan trees, and oak trees. So when they're traveling, they take a lot of breaks. It's an exhausting journey. So they actually only fly or travel for about four to six hours a day. 
The rest of that time is spent filling up on nectar and sleeping. They sleep a lot. And when they sleep, they cluster for protection like you can see in this photo. So we know a lot about monarch butterflies now. They're important for several different reasons. Monarchs are key pollinators, which allow us to have a lot of the plants that we like and need for different resources. Um, but there's also a lot that threatens them. Over the last 20 years, we've seen a decrease in the monarch butterfly population by 80%. Now, this is due to a loss of habitat for breeding, migrating, and overwintering, i.e. clearing of forests. Um, their populations have also declined because of pesticide and chemical use, because of climate change, because of parasitoids and disease, and because of natural disasters, which are made worse with climate change. So what can we do about it? We can plant native milkweed. Milkweed, as we know, is the only food source for monarch caterpillars and is consequently essential to them reaching adulthood. So planting native milkweed is one of the first things that we can do for monarchs. And milkweed is a pollinator plant for not just monarchs. Um, some other types of pollinators do like to sip the nectar from milkweed flowers. Um, the leaves are toxic, so it's pretty much exclusively used, the leaves anyways, for monarch caterpillars. But monarch um, milkweed, excuse me, has far more uses than just protecting monarch butterflies, though that is an important use. Another thing that you can do is plant for native pollinators and encourage others to do the same. So pollinators need food in order to survive, but also they need little pockets of food while they migrate. So pollinator gardens planted at your house or on your property or wherever you're able to plant is extremely important to the health of pollinators and the health of native plants in your area. So that is the end of this lecture. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comments and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Thanks.